So we're going to get going. I welcome everybody. This is the Monday, November 30th, 2020 meeting of the Northampton Historical Commission. And as everyone knows, this is an online meeting. They went to Governor Baker's emergency order modifying the state's open meeting law issued March 12, 2020. Mm -hmm. This meeting will be held using remote participation. Um, and it is being recorded, so everybody knows that. We do have um, a, an issue in front of us tonight that I think a number of the folks who have joined uh, are concerned about. And before we begin the public comment period, I just wanted to um, be clear with all involved here that uh, this meeting of the commission is to review um, an application a pertaining a property, two properties actually, but one in particular. Uh, and what we will be doing here is uh, really the very first step of a demolition delay process. And this step involves determining whether this, the commission uh, believes this property is historically significant. And um, if that's the case, then we would continue it to a public meeting, which needs to happen within 30 days of this meeting. Um, so what I would like to just say before we start is um, there'll be ample time at the public um, hearing, which is data is yet to be established uh, for all who are concerned or interested or like to support or oppose um, the project to voice your, um, your thoughts. And tonight um, we'd like to um, keep the public comment to a reasonable amount of um, time because we have other items on our agenda. Um, we do have 20, uh, looks like uh, 18 folks have joined us and because there's so many, um, for those of you, we prefer to use the chat function for those of you who are not comfortable speaking in public and uh, we'd like to treat, try to keep the comments to about 10 if possible. So please, if you, want to make comments um, to not repeat what others have said who came before you. So we will start with public comment. And for those of you who want to speak, please raise your hand. We don't have a, a hand function um, on Zoom. So you have to actually physically raise your hand and you could state your name and your uh, address. If anybody would like to start, you're welcome to start. And pl also, please mute your um, mute yourself when you're not speaking. Can I start, Chris Thompson? Yes. My name is Chris Thompson, and I live at 41 Warner Street, uh, which is just down the street, two houses down from 61 Warner Street. And I'm going to read a brief statement. Porter Nutting bought a lot from Samuel Hill, a prominent abolitionist, and built the house at 41 Warner Street in 1858. He purchased the lot at 61 Warner, also from Samuel Hill, in 1860, and built the house soon after, selling it to James Riley in 1862. 61 Warner Street and 41 Warner Street are two of four identical houses in a row. Two and a half years ago, my partner and I bought 41 Warner and proceeded with an extensive house renovation. The house was in considerably worse condition than 61 Warner Street is. Uh, we, were, we were both in 61, we were both in 61 Warner Street this summer and were able to do a full assessment of its condition and it absolutely does not need to be demolished. <clears throat> Excuse me. During the renovation of 41 Warner, I found a framing technique that I had never seen before in my 23 years of doing restoration, carpentry, and general contracting. I was so surprised that I called in the help of my mentor, Steve Striebel, to help me figure out what was going on. Steve Striebel is a master rest restoration carpenter and mason with decades of knowledge and an extensive resume involving significant properties throughout New England. He also has worked for both historic Deerfield and historic New England, formerly known as Spinia. 
in two uh, in 2018, uh, he came to assess 41 Warner, uh, which is identical to 61 Warner. Mr. Striebel uh, is in his 70s with 50 plus years a 50 plus year career in historic preservation. And he said that he has never seen this building technique used in Western Massachusetts and only rarely in Eastern Mass. The house was built post and beam with no studs. Instead, Porter Nutting used mortared bricks to support the frame. The exterior only had one layer, which was vertical board and batten. This gave the house a Gothic cottage look. Inside, the structural brick was parged for, a smooth, for smooth walls. Porter Nutting owned a brickyard around the corner and it was the Civil War era and materials might have been scarce or expensive. Maybe this is why he built the houses this way. Regardless, they are unique. They are a unique example of ingenuity and engineering. That's it. That's it. Thank you for listening. I appreciate it. Thank you, Chris. I also That's submitted a great this. synopsis. Yeah, I, I submitted this to the, in it as an email, and I have um, maps and photographs to verify oh. what I'm saying. And the house was built when Abraham Lincoln was our president. That's great. And we, I, I just mentioned it. I forgot to mention at the beginning that we, um, Sarah uh, Lavallee, our staff liaison, has been forwarding all of the email that we have, um, city has received on this property. And um, a lot of it came in late today and we're busy. So I, did, I personally did not get to get through all of it, but right. certainly will before the, um, the next, the public, um, public hearing. And there were also some Did nice photographs else? from Chris. Thank you. There were a couple of photographs too mm -hmm. of the structure. So thank you. Anybody else would like to speak? I see Bill Ryan. Uh, did I understand you to say there is going to be a public hearing if you already decided to about the significance? Yes, there will be a public hearing if tonight the commission votes to um, determine this property to be historically significant. So that's there will the be a continuation to, within the next 30 days. Okay, I was just gonna hold my comments if they would already been decided, but it doesn't sound like it's actually been decided by you all. So um, I, I just, I sent you something so I won't spend much time on it, but uh, I, I got interested in this and looked at the uh, three houses on Warner Street. We live at 129 Warner Street. And uh, I looked at the three houses between 61 and 129 that actually have, what are they called? The uh, form Bs uh, in, of historical significance. And there's three of them mm -hmm. and they're all uh, fairly similar houses to the ones I live in and, the, and 61. And all the houses up and down the street that were all built about the same time as, as uh, well, cutlery workers uh, homes. And so when I look at your criteria that you have to decide on, um, it just seems to me that both uh, criteria C and criteria D uh, kind of th the, this house checks off the boxes for that. Because those forms, uh, the, the reason for the historical significance designation was uh, checked off as community development. And this house was built early on in that community of houses that were built. And so it matches up the same way. So I just think hopefully you'll look at those other houses and see that already things have been decided to be significant and this house is part of that same cultural development that was going on. Um, and a second member for apportioning- And then the, uh, as far as uh, uh, criteria D, um, it, it, you're, it's required to be historically or architecturally important in terms of period style method of building construction or association with a recognized architect or builder in the context or in the context of a group of buildings. And, and when you look at the houses all the way up and down our street, they all have, they've all been changed significantly over the years, but they all have the same core house, the same core building me method, the same everything. They're, they're, I guess they were known as, uh, as mill workers houses. And so if you go walk down our street, which our, our house, which is at the top of the hill, all the way to the bottom of the hill, all along both sides, especially to the north side, there's all these houses that were built with the same basic construction material, the same basic frame. They were small rectangular houses with frame construction. And um, 
And so if you start to take out some of those houses here and there and put in modern houses, you're gonna lose the feel of this whole group of buildings that creates the historical uh, sense of this neighborhood. And, uh, and I, I, we don't know what this proposal involves past demolition at this point, as far as I can tell, but uh, it, it, if you put three modern houses in, on that lot, you're gonna break up that coherent sense of those houses all being part of the same community. And so I think under both criteria, C and D, uh, hopefully it will be a pretty easy decision for you. Uh, if, if it's not, then hopefully you'll decide to go on and make it uh, go to the public hearing stage and get more input because obviously lots of people are interested in this. And there's probably many people in our community that have uh, a lot to say about the history as they know it of the area. Uh, we've, we're already finding a lot out just through these couple of days that we've had to, uh, to explore this. So, so thanks for listening. Thank you, Bill. Anybody else? Jackie? I just quickly wanted to say that I live at 35 Warner Street, which is one of those houses that was built on the same footprint. We still have um, a dirt cellar with the stone walls. It's always been a source of pride that this was a mill worker's house, that it is part of the history of the development of um, our village. It is a village. And that house at 61, Warner Street can be rehabbed, can be saved, and I would vote to do so. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. Anybody else? Um, Jackie? Catherine Commodore? Yeah, that's me. Sorry, I was muted. Mm -hmm. That's okay. I have to screen over to or move my screen over to see you <laughs> waving. So, okay, thank you. Um, I also live at 129 Warner and Bill's partner, so I hope you can forgive another person speaking from the same residence. Um, I just wanted to say thank you for um, hearing us all here, um, thanks to the Historic Commission. And I just wanna say that um, those of us that live in this neighborhood really value it tremendously and the historical nature of these houses, um, being able to be in a place where all these old houses are something that we value a lot. Um, we, we moved to this neighborhood and bought our old mill worker style house in um, 2010, I think it was 2010. Um, and it was also in a state of pretty poor repair um, when we purchased it. And um, <laughs> we had a meeting with an architect to decide how we could renovate. And the first thing he said to us, I think your best value would be to tear it down. And um, we didn't tear it down because that wasn't what we valued. <laughs> And um, so, um, and our neighbors actually have thanked us many times <laughs> for not tearing it down. So I know that there are others that, that just value what we have here and um, it would kind of dramatically alter the, the way the history of this street feels to start tearing down these old houses. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Catherine. Anybody else? Uh, I have... uh, Diane Scott. So <clears throat> I live at 44 Landy Avenue and I live across the street from the 39 Landy Avenue property. And I know that this is a done deal. We have already come before the commission and we were politely informed that it was an insignificant property or unremarkable. And I just wanna to just for the sake of not being sorry later that I didn't say something, that the significance of a property or a home sometimes has to do with who built it or whether somebody famous lived there, but also it has to do with, we've been in this home for 30 years and the people that lived across the street from us were certainly a significant part of our life. I learned how to cane chairs from him. Um, we shared gardening thing. We shared, we shared a lot together. They were our neighbors. And everybody on the street knew them because they had been here since the 1930s, I think. And so just want to say that as we go to look at this, it, it, 61 Warner sounds like it really does have some, some interesting and significant structural bones to it. But as we move forward with these developments and these old homes are torn down and replaced with new ones, 
you can't ever get back what you tear down. So just if, if I, I just want to ask the city to just hopefully have one foot on the brake, ready to press it if, if it needs to get pressed. And that's all I have to say. And I am, I'm, I'm a rather insignificant citizen myself, but living in an insignificant house, but I just want us to look past the, the structure and the, the architecture of a home before we consider it inconsequential. Thank you. Thanks, Diane. And just um, in response, no one, no one's voice here is insignificant. <laughs> well, <laughs> good. Anybody else? I'm scanning my screen. Let's see here. Ryan O'Hara, just to be clear, I'm the attorney for, for New Gen, or excuse me, New Way, and I'm here on behalf of New Way and would like to make a presentation at some point, but I'm happy to wait until all members of the public have had their say. I just want to make clear that we are here and wish to present to the board on this issue. Anybody else for public comment? Um, yeah, this is Joe Marbello. I, I'm, I don't have my... Uh screen up so I can't wave my hand okay <laughs> but uh, I live up the street from uh, 39 Landy Avenue and um, I've been my family's been in this house since the early 60s and I remember when the previous owners put up that fence and they had collies the dog collies they used to run around in the yard that's what the fence was for to keep them in there and the previous owner had done a lot of planting he had different types of trees pear trees apple trees and everything else and he has these big trees i'm not sure of the the um uh, type of tree they are but they are like a tall pine tree um it's sad to see that that house to be torn down and i know that like diane that it's probably past due to say to save it but part of the street that's been nice is the fact that there's not a lot of houses on the street. Mm -hmm. It's a very small street. Uh, Mainsfield is at the end of the street and it has a lot of cars that come up and down from that street. And if you add tons of houses on top of one another, you're going to make it a very, very busy street. Mm -hmm. And I don't like to see that happen. And I sympathize with the people on Warner street because I think they do, they see the same thing. You've got some very, old houses, very narrow streets. Mm -hmm. And if you start to pile in houses on top of that, mm -hmm. you're going to have a lot of cars in a very small area trying to get up and down it. Mm -hmm. Plus, you are going to get rid of the historic values of it. I had a cousin who owned a house in the uh, Charlestown section of Boston. And uh, his house looked like this. they did when Paul Revere rode his horse. You mm -hmm. walk through the doors and it was, you know, the 21st century of a house. But the neighborhood remained the same. Mm -hmm. uh, I think if you start tearing down the old houses here, mm -hmm. you're going to start tearing them down on North Street and some of the side streets from there, Union Street and all that. And you, you're you going to lose the charm of Northampton. Mm -hmm. And that's something you got to take in consideration. That's all I have to say. Thank you, Joe. Anybody else? Uh, is it in my site, Raise? Yeah, I just want to very briefly second and endorse what my neighbors are saying and celebrate what I think is a very democratic expression of community, which we need these days. But I just wanted to underline that we are not just talking about individual houses. We are talking about apparently projects that are happening in many houses. We are talking about the neighborhood. Um, so just that we should decide, you know, what the change that we are willing to accept for our neighborhood, while at the same time agreeing, as I think everybody agrees that people need houses, affordable houses. We fully support a, a rational infill policy, but a rational one, not one that agglutinates people um, in a way that maybe is not, 
is not very good for the city or for the neighborhood. Thank you. And just for our information, uh, where, what is your address, please? 172 Federal Street. Okay, thank you so much. Hi. Anybody I'm, else? I'm Sue Norton from Winslow Avenue. Oh, I must have my oh. So, uh, Sue, do you want to continue? Yes, I'm. We've lived on Winslow Avenue since 1974, and the thing that bothers me about New Way Homes is the extreme nature of their infill. Um, infill, Bay State has a lot of the character. The whole character of the Bay State neighborhood is a combination of the mostly old houses and the and the the the, the, the trees the, the woods and the fields and to uh, radically alter that like like uh, the new way homes is doing down at the Warner and uh, uh, federal street a lot is startling when you walk by mm -hmm. changes it just in that one lot changes the whole character of Warner Street, and you can see what will happen if if this continues with with every uh, lot that New Homes uh, buys, New Way Home spies. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Sue. Anybody else? Tracy. Hi, I'm just a renter. I rent on Wood Street, but from. Uh, family who's been in the area for many years and I care about uh, historical architecture and the character of the neighborhood because I love it. And, you know, we all know that corporatists can't be made to understand what the character of a neighborhood might mean to anyone. But I think if we just hearken back to, remember when there were detours down through Warner Street when there was construction on Riverside there. And just how uh, the residents put up signs about please go slow because this was not a thoroughfare for traffic to go through. Mm -hmm. And then you've got the high school down at that intersection where two streets come ridiculously to a V and it's like at certain times of the morning it's really difficult to make a right or a left. Shoehorning more people into these streets that were built many, many years. It's treacherous enough. And with people needing to park on the streets, I see that as a major problem as well. In addition to everything everybody else has said. And I think that's something we can harken back in recent memory to and think about. You know, is this where we really want to go with this area? Anyway, that's it. Thank you, Tracy. Anybody else before we move on? And remember, you will have an opportunity to comment that, um, if there is a public hearing. Um, also, for those of you who haven't spoken, I would encourage you to use the chat function. We are saving that, um, and that information will become public record. So it's important to, all of your comments are very important to voice and, um, and have recorded. I take one other comment and then we need to move on. Anybody else? All right. Okay, we're gonna open the meeting then. Um, and before we move on to the other agenda items, we need to, we had to take a break to approve a couple of sets of minutes. So um, the commissioners would please your tune your attention to the two sets of minutes we have in front of us. Um, one bidding deck back to January 13th, the other to August 31st. And uh, we can take these one by one <clears throat> um, or as a group. Does anyone have any of the commissioners have any comments on these? Trying to find you guys on here. Um, I don't have any. Uh, this is Barbara. I don't have any uh, comments. You know, it's trying to remember meetings from a while ago. But I would move to approve both of sets of minutes. Second. Okay, it's done. All right. Any comments? Any discussion? 
I did find one type of uh, Sarah, which I will send to you. Okay, great. Thanks, Martha. Sure. Okay. And we need to vote. Um, Sarah, we need, you need to do a roll call, right? Correct. Um, Martha? Uh, yes. Barbara? Yes. Craig? Yes. And Dylan? Yes. All right, unanimous, thank you. Okay, great, thanks. So we have two um, determination of significance um, items on the agenda. And I'd like to take the 61 Warner first. Um, the second we will do, which is 254 Wilson, Wilson Road, we will do um, after 61 Warner. And before we um, discuss it as a commission, I just wanted to read for the commissioners, um, the criteria that we need to adhere to, to um, to make our decision about this. Shuffling out of papers, just bear with me, here it is. Just to remind everyone, <clears throat> you can only um, vote based on the criteria that are listed in the ordinance and there are four. And just again, to repeat, this is only a determination of significance and it is the first step in the demo review. So if the commissioners uh, determine that the building is to historically significant, there will be a public hearing to determine whether it should be properly preserved. And that will be scheduled within 30 days. The significant determination, if we so choose tonight, does not create a delay, it's just a first step. So just so everyone is clear about that. And then the criteria that we will be uh, considering, therefore, as I mentioned, the first is um, that the building is, or structure is listed on or is within an area listed on the National Register of Historic Places. The second is the building or structure has been found eligible by the National Park Service or the Massachusetts Historical Commission for the National Register of Historic Places and or the state register or has an application pending. The third is the building or structure is importantly associated with one or more historic persons or events or with the broad architectural, cultural, political, economic or social history of the city or the Commonwealth. And then finally, the fourth, the building or structure is historically or architecturally important in terms of period, style, method of building construction, or association with a recognized architect or builder, mm -hmm. either by itself or in the context of a group of buildings. So those four need to be considered. Um, and I would like to um, invite the commission members to comment. Martha, I, I would like to comment, but I noticed something pop up on the chat while you were reading that, that somebody wanted to know whether the applicant was gonna be able to speak. Is that before or after we make comments? Or? It will be after the commissioners um, okay. discuss. Okay, well, can I, as long as I have unmuted myself, I'll start. Um, even when I went to I went to look at 61 Warner and I got out and I walked around and I could see it was vacant so I thought it was okay to peek in the windows and I could see that parts of it inside were quite interesting because some of the um, interior finishes had been stripped away a little bit so I could see some interesting older um, uh, things going on in more interior to the walls. Um, the main part of the house, I believe, still has a slate roof on it. So it seemed to me that this house was was interesting and also in the streetscape was a significant contributor. Even before I heard from any of these neighbors um, at all, I think it definitely meets at, at least several of the um, criteria for being considered significant. But yeah. I do want to say that I am so delighted to have all this additional information and comments. When we looked at 39 Landy, I think we really didn't have that. Um, so it's, um, you know, it may be something that the commission, we have to make sure we reach out more. I can't remember what was done when we were looking at 39 Landy. 
Um, but you know, we need this kind of information to be able to make um, intelligent, informed decisions. Um, so again, thank you for everybody who sent things because I, I was able to at least glance at, at the emails that we got late in the day. And um, I appreciate all the comments um, and contributions of everybody in the neighborhood or nearby. But I definitely, I, I don't see, even as I said, even before I heard from all of these people, I had decided in my mind that I was gonna vote I would vote to consider this significant so that it moves on to the next step um, to see if it's preferably preserved. Thanks, Barbara. Craig or Dylan? Um, I'll go next. Um, so thank you to the to the neighbors. Um, Chris spoke very eloquently about the architectural significance and the cultural significance of the house and the neighborhood. I think it's it, it has its place on the streetscape. I moved to Winslow Avenue, one street over in 1980 and very familiar with the neighborhood. Um, it's a very cohesive neighborhood as it is now. And that's something that can't be said of a lot of Northampton. I think it really tells the story of Bay State Village and, and the paper mill village before that. Um, so I would just add to that that um, some of the names associated with the property. I mean, Samuel Hill is a legendary figure in Florence, but uh, Porter Nutting, who, um, from what we know, constructed these houses, um, ran the brickworks at the bottom of the high school hill, uh, later became Brown and Bailey Brickworks. Um, he worked with William Fennel Pratt to construct numbers of important buildings downtown. Um, when the Belding Brothers Silk Mill was constructed on Holly Street, provided a half a million bricks to construct it. Um, he is an important figure in the architectural history of the Northampton. So I think that that's important, but I also think that the folks who lived in these houses, um, like others have said, uh, the Riley family, the Day family, um, these were people who worked in the cutlery factories. Um, in the Day family, as well, the women worked in the silk mills around here. Um, for generations, people who lived in these homes worked in the cutlery or the wire factories when I was growing up. So I think it's it really is a part of the history of this neighborhood, which remains cohesive. Um, we often are looking at individual houses, um, which we're sad to say are the last of their kind in the neighborhood. Um, I think that the, the importance of this being one of four identical houses or more that are very similar and this can't be ignored. I think we have an opportunity to preserve a, a character here. So I would vote to deem it significant and then have the hearing. Thanks, Dylan. Craig? Yes, well, I'm, I'm heartened to hear of all this history that we didn't really know because of the hard work and research of the people in the neighborhood. I love this. I too live in a Civil War era home that was that was badly run down, badly run down, and we restored it. In fact, um, I live and breathe this stuff. You're looking at my little Zoom screen here. That is a bridge. Had I not bought that bridge, it would have been scrapped out. The bridge will be part of a trail connecting Boston to Northampton within five years. I'm on the Historical Commission because I love historical old neighborhoods. I love to hear the history fleshed out by the citizens as opposed to the mere formal form Bs. I think we're at a turning point here in town where we see about 30, 31 people on this. And I would think that once we get beyond whatever happens on Landy Street or Warner or whatever else happens in the neighborhood, there needs to be a call to action by the people in the community to flesh out the rest of the Form Bs as a very basic thing. We have the money through CPA that could be fundable. Uh, we need a citizen activist group to take this on. You know, the, 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 the gold standard of historic preservation in a community is something called the local historic district. In the case of Northampton, that means the Elm Street 
local historic district. That didn't come together because people sat there over tea talking about it. That was a pitched battle for 18 months. And every community in Massachusetts that goes through that tiresome fraught with danger and anger process, it's, it's very difficult. The first step is to do a form B for every historic or older building in the city. This is needed. This, this is now the call to action here. We're not talking about a local historic district here. We're merely talking about preserving an individual house or two here and talking about um, the cohesiveness of a neighborhood. And so the conversation I think should continue. Thank you. Thank you. And can I just say something with, um, uh, as Craig was talking about form Bs, that at one point, a, a number of years ago, the Historical Commission got a CPA grant and we did get a lot of the um, form Bs, which are the historical inventory forms for the state for a lot of properties in Northampton, some were added, some were revised. But I think, and Sarah can correct me if I'm wrong, that someone can submit a form B for their own house. Um, so if you can, you can check and see if your house has a form B, and if it doesn't, um, definitely submit one, because it's one way that we can make sure we have the form Bs for properties, so we have that information if a property comes up for any issue, including a, um, a demolition permit. Yeah, definitely. Um, form Bs can, are a, a historic inventory form that the Massachusetts Historical Commission has created. And uh, it, even if it's not being used as part of a demolition review process, it's just a great research tool about your own house or particular neighborhoods and anyone can complete these and submit these to Mass Historic. And currently, the, the absence of a Form D is in no way indicates that the house is not historic. Um, and I, I've seen a, a few, I can form, the, we, we created a fillable Form B um, that people can submit. I can get that on the Historic Commission's website later this week. And I, I've seen a few comments about the, the process and people not being aware of the significance determination. The way that the um, demolition review process is set up, this initial determination of significance does not need to be made at a public hearing. It's just the first step. And then uh, later, if a public hearing is triggered, then uh, the public notice sign would, would go out and neighbors would be made aware of it at that point. Great. Um, I, I don't need to say too much more. Um, I agree with my fellow commissioners of everything that they said. Um, it's fantastic to have such a great turnout. So many people care. And I think Craig is absolutely right. Um, we need activism. Um, this is not the only neighborhood in Northampton that, you know, seeing change. And um, uh, there are a lot of changes going on in the city um, anyway, because of all the turn of events that have happened and especially in the last year nationwide. So. Um, I wanted to just open it up for other comments, um, questions from the public before we take a vote on this. I, I certainly feel that the applicant needs to be given an opportunity to present here. Yeah, uh, I'd I'm, like to I'm, that, I'm opening it up for you, Ryan, please. I, appre I appreciate that. I just wasn't yeah. sure from how, from how you phrased it. So sorry, I've got my finger on the space bar. Let me find the actual mute button. All right. Well, first, let me add to the chorus of voices. Well, let me state my name for the record. Ryan O'Hara of Bacon Wilson and of 76 Pleasant Street, Northampton, Massachusetts. Uh, I can echo what I think everyone said, that as a person who lives in Northampton, but also has a lifelong connection to the city of Northampton and more particularly the village of Florence. Uh, my grandfather was Kenneth Pease. He ran a funeral home not too far from here. and. Uh, he lived in Florence pretty much his entire late adult life. So there's a deep love in my family for this neighborhood and, and this town and city. So I just want to make that clear to everyone at first. And that, uh, you know, I think that it really is heartening to see people take this sort of interest in, in their local community. Now, I did have a, a slideshow pulled together 
under the impression that you be presenting it earlier, I will spare everyone. It has pictures. It seems that everyone has gone and, and seen these properties. Uh, but just, you know, a few points. I, I think that Mr. De La Pena hit on something very, very important in his remarks. And that's that the issues that are being presented today are important ones. And they're things that talk about the characters of entire neighborhoods. And they're things that for those who feel passionately about them, I agree probably cry out for broader scale solutions, but that's not what we're here today to do. And that's not what this commission's job is. And it's not what the bylaw sets out as the analysis for tonight. What the bylaw requires for a demolition permit is that the board make an initial determination as to whether something's a significant structure. And I know you've already read the criteria for that, so I won't repeat them. Two of them are plainly inapplicable. It's not listed on any National Register of Historic Places. Yeah. It's not with the National Park Service. It's not with the Massachusetts Historical Commission. So you're left really with two different ideas. One, if it's importantly associated with one or more historic persons or events. Now, that's an important word, importantly associated. It doesn't mean just built by or someone stopped there or it existed when Abe Lincoln was president. It means it has a real significance to that person, to that event. Mm -hmm. There's nothing that's come before this board that's competent evidence from which to decide that this property at 61 Warner Street, not talking about the broad scale history of Florence, not talking about the broad scale city history of the city, but this structure has any sort of important connection to a historic event or an historic person. Now, moving on to the idea of whether it's architecturally important. Now, certainly I heard one thing tonight that suggested that there was any level of architectural importance that had to do with some interior wall framing. Now, I'm not an architect. I am not a historical expert. I can't sit here and tell you whether that's true or not. But what I can sit here and tell you is as a legal expert, when this board is tasked with making a narrow decision of historical significance, it needs to have competent evidence of that historical significance. And if this board's basis for determining this structure is significant is based on the suggestion that the framing is somehow special, that's not enough evidence to find historical significance. Likewise, the fact that this is in a neighborhood that developed over the time when Northampton was a mill city and was lived in at times by people that worked in those mills, certainly that, that is not to whatsoever diminish the importance of individual lives of people that have lived there. I wanna make that clear, but that's not what the historical bylaw is talking about. The historical bylaw is not there, or excuse me, the demolition bylaw is not there to render every structure that existed in Northampton prior to the 1950s untouchable. That bylaw does not make each of those structures significant. What it does is gives four very limited criteria on which a finding can be based. And unless this board has actual evidence that those criteria are satisfied, it cannot enter a finding that there's historical significance. And I agree that uh, for the comment that just came in, I work for Bacon Wilson. Uh, I have an office in both Springfield and Northampton on Center Street. Uh, the historical significance of a structure is something that needs to actually be established. It can't just be suggestion. It can't be speculation. This is a real piece of something. And I, I agree with a lot of what was said tonight and continues to ongo in the chats that perhaps there is a defect in the city's ordinance and bylaw to the extent that this determination doesn't require a public hearing because it's a real significant determination that impacts the rights of the property owner, certainly, but also, as you can see from the many people who showed up here today, and I take it from some of the comments in some previous cases that are totally unrelated, that there should be an opportunity for real public content because the board is making a decision, a decision that has legal impact and one on which it needs to have real evidence. And absent a true public hearing procedure, you can't have that. So. I would suggest that what the board has heard is certainly not enough to establish any of these four criteria. When you look at this house and its exteriors, it has vinyl siding. It has drop 
drop tile ceilings that I can't think of what the material is, <laughs> the right word for the material. But this is not a house that has these beautiful interior touches. This is a old home and frankly, nothing more. And I understand it's a part of a neighborhood, but just because something's a part of a neighborhood, that's not sufficient basis to find a historic or significant structure in its individual capacity. And as a closing thought, you know, again, I respect greatly, and as a member of the community, have participated in similarly, the passion people have about their homes and their neighborhoods. I understand that. But what I hear tonight, and what I think most of the information that's been directed or been pushed towards the board has been the idea that, well, look what might happen with this property. You heard about traffic issues. You heard about other properties where people have regrets. You're hearing all these impermissible things that are really considerations for zoning bodies or what might happen if there ever is needed a permit or a special permit. Those are issues that are properly addressed then. But the sole issue before this board are these four criteria. And where there has been no solid, real, verified evidence of historical significance of um, this structure in particular, not of a neighborhood, not of the general community, but this structure and its importance in that. Absent that, you can't make a finding of significance. And of course, New, New Way would respectfully request that the board appropriately decide that there, this is not a individually significant structure as it has not been given the evidence to do so. But I understand that seemingly before we were allowed to present, the commission's already voted and uh, I'll look forward to seeing everyone at public hearing. Ooh. Um, the commission, just to make clear, the commission hasn't taken a vote. That's I'm sorry, I, I misunderstood what people were saying they would vote in a certain way. I apologize. We have to do a formal vote with a roll call. So that's why we're asking for you know any comments because we want to make sure we have enough information to make an informed vote. Anybody else wish to comment? Um, yeah, um, I'd like to comment if possible. Yes. Yeah, I'm sorry. I uh, this is Hannah Cartman. I live on Lexington Avenue, um, and in full disclosure, live in a house that was built by New Way Homes, um, and bought the house after it had already been developed. So John Hansel didn't work for me in any way. I, I bought the home from him after it had been, um, it had been uh, developed. And what I want to say is that I think that these are very complicated issues. Um, and that there isn't a single solution. Um, I love the Bay State neighborhood. I really wanted to be in the Bay State neighborhood. I agree with all of the things that my neighbors have said, many of whom I know and respect about the cohesion in the neighborhood, um, which is partially why we wanted to be here. And we did a home search for quite some time and had a lot of difficulty finding something that could work for our family and also didn't require um, extensive renovation that we didn't have the capacity to do. Um, and I, I agree with the arguments about um, paying attention to neighborhoods and also to the historic significance of neighborhoods. I also really see the need for housing in the Northampton core um, that is available um, and, and affordable. And I think we could argue about what affordable means. I, you know, I, I have heard people in this conversation say that there are $200,000 homes in this neighborhood. I have not seen those. And believe me, we looked. Um, and so, you know, all I wanna say is I think we have to think really carefully about the precedence of these decisions and what they mean, not only for a particular site and the neighbors on that site, but for attempts to have in full in Northampton, which has been a commitment from the town uh, for very good reason. And so that's what I wanted to say. And I, I guess the one other thing I wanna say is, you know, I did have the opportunity to get to know John, you know, after actually we bought this home. Um, and I have found him not only reasonable, but very concerned about neighborhoods and about matching the tone of neighborhoods and willing to talk with people about that. And I don't appreciate some of what's been said in that conversation and wonder if people have had these conversations directly with him. 
um, because certainly my experience has been that he has been more than willing to hear and uh, to take into consideration people's ideas. That's it. Thank you, Hannah. Anybody else? Could I say something? Yes. So my name's Teresa um, Pianta. I used to live in Bay State Village on 14 Liberty Street. Um, so I understand the neighborhood. And I also, like Hannah, have a home now that was built by John. I had to move out of the Bay State Village neighborhood because I was living in a pre-1900s historic home. And it is not something that a single parent can afford to live in or take care of. Um, unfortunately, these homes are just not of the caliber uh, that they can be restored in a way that is cost effective for everyone that can live here. Um, so buying a new home was more appropriate for my family. Um, and I think that my new home fits the character of the neighborhood. And I think that John is willing to uh, work in that capacity to not have this be some McMansion that looks like it's out of touch with the neighborhood or the times. Um, so I think if you're really trying to get uh, families and um, people to be interested in affordable homes in a neighborhood, to be willing to come to a community that, um, that, that you have to think about the ability to provide them with stuff that's up to today's standards. Thanks. Great. So I just um, I want to remind people, we have a very limited purview here tonight. And um, I know there are a lot of other related um, issues related to affordable housing and the zoning bylaw, uh, saving trees and so forth. And we are not, um, it is not the historical commission's prerogative to be dealing with that. Ours is really to decide about the historical importance of this property. So unless people have other comments related to that, um, I would um, move to um, have the commission make a vote, take a vote about whether this property is to be determined to be significantly uh, significant. May I say something? Sure. Okay, there's some other people raising their hand too. Uh, Paul, would you wanna go? Um, look, we just, I don't really want to comment on the Historical Commission's purview. I'm sorry, I know that you had just mentioned that. Powell and I have lived in Northampton for 30 years, and in August we moved into a new ways home. And believe me, we actually signed the petitions that were circulating in the neighborhood that was against it, that was against the color of it, that was against what it was doing to it, and really have come around 180 to appreciate what John has tried to do with this house. Um, this is not from, built on a teardown property. We lived at 186 Crescent Street in a succession of four houses that were Sears Roebuck's houses. All four of the owners were struggling with renovations and, and we had all dreamt about knocking things down. But honestly, when we moved to this address, 181 Round Hill Road, we found a bunch of the different things that we needed to solve to make our home more comfortable here. Okay, and I'm not really advocating for like home decor and that's the reasons why. I just wanted to enumerate on the other side of this, should the vote go towards the possibility that new ways is. But just that um, John cooperated and accommodated a lot of the different neighbors' requests to try to do something that would blend in with where we are. It's almost impossible in this new house, much like the campus center at Smith, to make anything new look like an old part of the neighborhood. But every single passerby, not one, everyone who protested has come by and remarked upon the greatness of this house once it was finally built and done. I mean, obviously maybe if people don't like it, they might not say it, but it is, it is energy efficient. It's easy to be orderly about it. Um, and I think some of what people are saying depends on who lives in the new house. Some of the issues that people have brought up. Yeah. And um, so I just wanted to like underscore that um, I understand the loss of the historical neighborhood, but if the most objections from everybody else, they've all come around it. And I find that the house that we live in is quite accommodating. And I know that it's hard to tear down a house that is hundreds of years old with a lot of history. That's a different conversation, I think, than my, our attempt here to just try to underscore that John is somebody, if you let him, 
who will work with the neighborhood to try to make something that may or may not be within his right to do right. Thank you. We could take one other comment and then- I may. John. Yes. Hi, how are you? You know, all the, <clears throat> all the conversation has been about me and however they pronounce New Way Homes, doesn't really matter. They're happy with the houses. And I don't think there's any that purchase any from me that are not happy. I do cooperate the neighborhood, but I've re reached with a lot of hatred. Like one person has told me that I build ugly houses and then I go home, go home to Long Meadow where I don't even live in Long Meadow. And I said, I was thinking of moving to Northampton. And then she told me I shouldn't even, I, my type, doesn't, I don't, they don't need my type up there. I met a lot of hatred up there lately. And I think I only want is this meeting to be judged as it's supposed to be judged on the merit of the house. And it doesn't really have the historical value, not, on, not anything else. But I don't think I'm doing anything bad but opening spots for other neighbors to move in, other families to move in. And the, the town does need more housing. But like I said, a lot of other families can move in here and it seems like people have their own houses. They just don't want anybody else to move in around there. So a lot of thoughts and a lot of opinions, but it's always a lot of people have their house and that's, they don't want anything to change. And I can understand that nobody likes change. That's it. Okay, thank you, John. All right, one more and then we need to move on. Did someone else, was someone else waving? Okay. All right. Um, well, I think we've come to the uh, last of the um, presentations, comments, and the commissioners. Do you feel ready? You're ready to make a vote on this, Barbara? Yes. Can I? Yes. Dylan. I... Okay. Um, do we do we need me need me to read the criteria again? Does everybody are you you're familiar with that now? I don't. Okay. Joy. Craig, Dylan. I need to vote. Okay. All right. Someone needs to make a motion. A motion. I would move that the house at um, I should know the address, 61 Warner Street, should be declared significant. That's really all we have to say, right? We do we do you need it in the motion on what criteria it's based, or we just say it can be significant I yeah the, the finding on on which criteria it would be okay i do feel that it meets cmd i feel that uh, because we definitely are concerned not just with an individual structure but how it fits into the neighborhood and the streetscape and i feel that it is associated with a group whether it's mill workers or this one builder who, who built a number of um structures um this isn't all part of the motion, but um, just sort of justification for it. And uh, criteria D, definitely that it is important as a part, the context of a group of buildings. That's the end of that sentence on that criteria. So my motion is really that it's significant based on the criteria C and D. Right. Does someone want to second that? I'll second that. Dylan? Okay. Any discussion, further discussion? Okay, are we ready for a vote? Sarah? Martha? Uh, yes, accept the motion. Barbara? I, I vote yes for the motion. Craig? I vote yes for the motion. And Dylan? Yes, for the motion. Okay, so uh, what that means is that we will be holding, uh, uh, continue this discussion, we will be holding a public um, hearing uh, sometime in the next 30 days uh, that will be, that information will be made available um, shortly. And Sarah, what, um, what, given the COVID, what is the best way for people to get information about that? Uh, so that will be posted on as a public meeting on the city's website. Um, so that will be at some point 
in December, I, I guess at the end of the meeting, we'll talk about historic commission member availability. Okay, so people should look for it on the city website. And in the Gazette. I think it should be in the Daily Hampshire Gazette. Uh, there, there will be a yellow public notice sign posted in front of the property as well. Before the commission moves on to other business, I just want to say thank you for your time and uh, for listening this evening. I look forward to speaking to you again. Okay, thank you. Thank for thank you for all that um, participated in this. We very much appreciate it. Okay, we're going to. Yeah, you know, people are welcome to stay on. Um, they also could get off if they like. Uh, we're going to move on to the next uh, demolition request. Um, Determination of significance for um, 254 Old Wilson Road. And all of you probably know this property, it's adjacent to the old <clears throat> golf course, which is now a conservation area owned by the city. Go to East Hampton. That's near the golf course. Oh, uh, no. Someone needs to mute their, um, mute themselves. <laughs> Okay, so this is a property um, that was, I believe, owned by the folks who own the golf course, um, who recently sold it to the city. And um, do is there anyone in attendance who would like to speak about this, or any of the commissioners would like to speak about it? Okay. Well, go around. Okay. It took me a minute to find my mute button, my mute, unmute button. Um, I did go to look at this as well. Actually, it's a nice walk from my house to go up there. Mm -hmm. And one thing that did surprise me about the, I guess it would be a garage next to it, was I was surprised there wasn't some warning tape, warning mm -hmm. tape across it so that people would not go in it because it really looked. I know that we don't necessarily judge something on whether it's about to fall down, but it really did look dangerous that, you know, if somebody walked in there. Um, it certainly, you know, seemed like all of the building itself and that garage. And I, I don't think, are we just ruling on the house or, or or is does it include that other structure, Sarah? The sort of garage that's uh, yeah, next to Let it. me pull up the assessor database. Give me one minute. I can't sure. remember whether... What, what it said, or if it said. So the, the outbuilding was built in 1930. So mm -hmm. that, that's not being reviewed as part of this. So it's really just the house. Um, it's just the house. I can't imagine they're not going to demolish that other. But anyway, um, but well, it, it doesn't because it's an outbuilding. It's not subject to the demolition review. Oh right, that's right, right, right. I always forget that. So I, um, you know, we don't have a lot of information about it. Um, I guess if that was built in 1930, I don't know if the house was built around the same time, but it's. Um, uh, you know, we don't really have any information. I mean, obviously, it was associated with the golf course. Um, uh, 1900 like, is the, the construction date. Well, in the house. That's often just, as we know, an arbitrary date. So I don't have a lot to say about this one. It was in poor condition. It certainly looked like it was part of it was somebody lived there and then other parts, you know, maybe were used for the, um, I don't know if it was a clubhouse for the golf course or, or what. So, mm -hmm. no, no, there, there is a, there was a clubhouse or there is a clubhouse. I think the building's still there. Um, it, uh -huh. It's at the end of the driveway leading into the golf course. Um, okay. So way back on the property. And my understanding, I'm, I'm wrong about this. And maybe Dylan, you know, this property, this house was actually probably, um, the land was farmed before it became a golf course. And this house, you know, may have been associated with that activity. Right. right. Okay. 
Yeah, that makes sense. Um, it, it was a lot harder to find information on this house because of its location. Um, mm -hmm. It just doesn't tend to show up in as many Alice's and city directories and such. Um, so I don't have any significant information about anyone who lived there or uh, any unique history. Okay. Craig, do you have any comments about it? You're muted. You're muted. Sorry. It's an example of a of a house being torn down for an energy efficient one, but it'll be decades in before the energy efficiency will actually flip from the, the waste of the demolishment of the original house compared to the savings gathered in the future. It's really not a good thing to be tearing down houses based on energy efficiency, because that's a lot of what they talked about in the demolition application is the enhanced energy efficiency. And it's not really a quick turnaround on that. That's all I have to say. I don't think it's a significant house. There's no one here to talk about, talk it up on behalf of the house or the prevention of the demolition. That says a lot compared to what we've seen tonight. And so I'm, uh, that's all I have to say about that. Um, are there any members of the public here who would like to speak on its behalf or provide additional information? Okay, well, um, I think if someone would like to make a motion on this, I don't have much to add to it. I just am familiar with it because it uh, is associated with the golf course and which is now conservation land. Um, it was, I don't know what, I haven't, been, I haven't been by there recently, but I do know the property just from dealing with that conservation land. And I do know that it was the place where there was a lot of equipment stored. Um, equipment, uh, surplus landscaping materials. It was sort of like a, um, kind of like a boneyard, I guess I would say for the golf course. And so um, it's always appeared to me quite poor shape. And I know the condition is listed on the res and the assessment database is being poor. So um, if anybody would like to make a motion on this. And again, just to frame it, this is the, the same four criteria. Correct. Thanks. Regarding significance. Yeah. Do, do people need me to read those again? No. Okay. Again, would someone like to make a motion? I will move to declare the property the, the house at 254 Old Wilson Road to be not significant. Second, anybody? Sure. Second, yeah. Greg. Okay. All right. Any more comments? Any more discussion? All right. Then we should um, roll call. Martha? Yes. Barbara? Yes. Craig? Yes. Dylan? Yes. Okay, so that one can move forward. All right, um, the next item on the agenda is a review of the um, Safe Roads to School pro program, which is being um, proposed for the Parsons Bridge Street uh, school area. And you've had a package of this that came in our um, materials from Sarah that showed the locations of the proposed walkways. And I'm understanding, Sarah, this is a 106 review. It um, is, this is using federal funding. Uh, so this is trip the section 106 review process. And at least some of this is in the new um, 
historic district, correct? The National National correct. Register District, yeah, okay. So um, I don't know if anybody had a chance to look at this. Um, is so this is proposed. It's not. Is has it been funded? Uh, I believe it has been funded. Okay. Did anybody have any questions or comments about this? I was. Um, oh, go ahead. Anybody have any questions or comments about this? Craig. I have a question. What was the construction project on Holly Street related to this overall project? I didn't quite get that. Maybe I didn't read it thoroughly enough, but I just don't understand why Holly Street has a portion of the construction. Is that like a bus parking area to bring kids over to the Bridge Street School? I just didn't understand this. So they have a, uh, a walking school bus, um, which takes the place of a bus for, for children to walk to school okay. in a couple different locations. One goes down Bridge and one meets right in that Holly Street neighborhood and okay. passes through that section. I know that they were doing construction recently on the what's now the Northampton Arts Trust parking lot. Um, I don't know of any other construction in that stretch there. Um, so. It's hard to see if that square stretches that far or if it's closer to the Sarah, do you know if this was um, an outgrowth of the study that was being done for Parsons Street, um, along by the Bridge Street School, or Bridge, I'm sorry, Bridge Street Cemetery? That I don't know. Um, this area has been long recognized as being deficient for pedestrian improvements. So this may be something that's been in the works for quite some time. Um, yeah, so, so here's, here's my concern about this. I'll just put it out there. I, you know, I've been involved with the Bridge Street Cemetery off and on for a while. Um, I think it's an, an important, unfortunate choice to put the sidewalk um, on the south side of Parsons Street. And the reason I say that is because the cemetery along Parsons Street really closely abuts the road edge. And there are graves that are almost spilling into the road along a lot of the stretch of that. And, um, you know, one of the ways to um, protect those would be to make a sidewalk along there rather than having the road edge go right up to the edge of the cemetery. And I think, I just wondered if there had been a, any consideration to putting a, cross, a sidewalk on that side of the road as well. I know it's a very narrow street but I'm just wondering if that was something that was considered. Um, can we ask questions about this? Are, we're expect, are we expecting to just comment and then they, they will take our comments? We're not voting on it, correct? Uh, so the, the procedure with these is typically to provide Mass Historic and the applicant any comments regarding uh, negative impacts to historic resources. But if there's other comments, so we could certainly make those. Well, so Martha, just to be clear, you're asking, about whether it would be possible to put a sidewalk on the cemetery side of Parsons? I wondered if that was considered. It's So if you look at the, the Parsons Street map uh, where it intersects North Street, you can see where there's already some um, encroachment issues with the right of way. And I, I think it's just not physically possible to put a sidewalk on that part of, on that side of Parsons Street without some, at least without some really significant takings. Right. Well, takings would be, I um, mean, be in the public way. No. Uh, so to maintain the, the street um, cart, cartway um, and travel way, I, there'd have to be a, a taking of the, 
uh, the yards. And I, I think just almost, it's, it's, so the, you'd have to do a taking of the, the yards and probably even maybe a portion of the houses on the, the, uh, the Western side of Parsons Street. So that, that may be the issue. But so essentially what they're, they're proposing here to upgrade the existing asphalt sidewalk. Correct. Okay. So the sidewalk couldn't be moved to the other side of the road, being removed and removed and moved. That's what I'm asking. That was considered. Okay. Um, that, that I don't know. Okay. Yeah, I I share your concern about the vulnerability of those graves that are right up against the fence, may even be under the fence in some instances. Yeah. I know we found that Erastus Hopkins' grave was inches, it felt like, on the fence there. Um, yeah. But I do think it would be difficult to switch the side of that for a number of reasons, because of the properties on the North Street end, and then also because of the, the lineup of the crosswalks for the school and the bus turnoff. Um, you'd have to have them cross over. I, I do know a crossing guard got hit last year right at that corner. Um, and that might be some of why they feel strongly that should, this work should be done now because there's poor visibility. Um, maybe it's completely irrelevant, um, but that might be difficult to pull because of the, the ways the crosswalks line up at both ends of the street. Yeah, the North street yeah. Side and yeah I know it's a really narrow street. Um, I And I also wondered if they looked at making it one way um, right. because it, it really can't even accommodate two, two ways of traffic now. Um, right, and it handles school buses, which is yeah. I mean, it's just really, it's um. But I'm I'm looking at it, and I see what Sarah means about you know the side where it almost looks like the houses are in the roadway here, so at least in the yeah, right they're away. Right. Yeah, so they're I mean, right in. Yeah, go possible ahead. Not to do from North Street, you know, all all the way, but just do it where it's where the cemetery is on one side of it and then have a crosswalk when that sidewalk ends. But again, the narrowness of the street, they probably couldn't do that, but it might be something to suggest. Yeah, with the width of the street, I don't think that would be able to be accomplished unless like Martha said, it was converted to a one way street. Yeah. Right. And they obviously wouldn't want to move that part onto another side of the street. Mm -hmm. Because right, they want the sidewalk onto the crossing for maybe, So maybe we could comment and you know raise the issue of the vulnerability of the of the edge of the cemetery right there and ask yeah. if they be considerate or sensitive to the I think that's a good idea. I absolutely think we should do that. Yeah. Um, yeah. And does anyone see any issues with any of the rest of the proposal and negative impacts of the Pomeroy Terrace National Register District? I think these are really good um, projects in general. I think that they're really important just to get people walking. And um, it's hard to tell from these drawings actually how wide these sidewalks are that they're proposing, um, unless there's some sort of a standard detail that I don't see on here. Uh, part the one on Parson Street will be five and a half feet. Okay. As they they've redone so much of the Bridge Street sidewalks as part of the the roundabout project um, on both sides of the street in some places, although they don't connect by Sheldon Field, there's a stretch there that I thought would be on this as well. Um, but I would imagine that they would match that sort of look, grade. Yeah, so I, I guess what I would say is just what people are saying is we may, we, I think we should just uh, send a comment saying that, you know, we're in supportive of the Safe Routes program and um, making upgrades to Parsons pedestrian network um, that there is concern about the um, fragility of the gray sites along Parsons Street and it's they're very, very close proximity to the road edge. Um,
and that we would hope at some point that there would be some consideration of how the edge got treated to improve um, the safety of the graves. But we don't really have, I mean, there's not much else we can really say, I don't think at this point. Does anybody else have any other comments about it that you would like to weigh in on? Um, I do have one question as I'm looking at this again. Um, and then Craig had mentioned something about why was there work being done on Holly Street? And this is really far down Holly Street. Mm -hmm. it's, is that where that walking school bus meets? It, it isn't at the Center for the Arts. <laughs> I see your cat now, Craig. Craig appearing. Oh, yes, it's, that's the way. It's like the treasure cat. He's appearing and disappearing. But anyway, but is that so that's where that school bus, walking school bus meets? It's pretty, pretty far yeah. down. That's they Isabella. designed that ed end of the walking school bus to start near the new um, housing construction on Pleasant so that the families. Oh, okay. yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, okay. Yep. Thank you for clarifying that. Okay. Makes much more sense now. My question was, or my comment was, I'm proud to see that there is for safe routes to school project coming to Northampton and being funded, that um, one of the first ones in the earliest part of the 20th, 21st century was the one at Jackson Street School, which uh, during the recession got um, more recognition in that, I'm not sure if your others are aware of this because they travel in the geek world, the policy, transportation policy, but during the recession, when they were bringing forward American Recovery Act money to all the states, all the states were commanded to spend at least 3% on bike head projects. And so Mass DOT scoured the entire state looking for shovel ready, remember that phrase, shovel ready projects that were ready to build. And they could only find four in the entire state. Two of them were here in Northampton. One was the Jackson Street School switchback, get up the Jackson Street Trail. That was a muddy slope. Kids were schlepping their bikes up. And now there's a prim and proper way to get up there. It was a safe route to school project initially led by Gwen Agden. So there, there's your little bit of history you probably didn't know to me. Yeah, that was a good project. I, you know, I think that uh, unfortunately um, there was kind of a bad mess, a mixed message sent out with that because the sidewalk improvements did not extend down to Hampshire Heights, and those sidewalks continue to be kind of run down and um, not, not such a great message. Uh, but it, I think it was really successful. So, otherwise, okay. Um, is there any mail, Sarah? Uh, there is not. Okay. Um, so a couple of things. Um, do we want? Do you want to say anything about Pauline, um, Sarah? Uh, so, as some of you may know, Pauline's house is on the market now, and she's planning a an upcoming move to Buzzards Bay. So she, her, her time on the commission is unfortunately getting short. Um, and in addition to being one of the uh, Realtors Association nominees, Pauline is also one of the two uh, required property owners within the district. So if anyone knows anyone who lives on either in, within the Round Hill or Elm Street district, that you think might be a good fit, please give them a, a encouraging words to apply. So her house is actually not in the district, but it's close. Very oh, it's close. not? Oh, I no, thought it was. No, she's on Forbes, but yeah, it's but it's very close. It's adjacent, basically. Um, there are I don't know whether the salt box is still on the market, um, and there's also the Hausman Corner of Elm and Woodlawn that is on the market now. Um, and so we had talked at the last meeting, I believe, about sending out information to the realtors on that. Yep. Okay. Yeah, so I, I'm doing that for, for all of those properties. Okay, great. Let us know if you're back any response, Sarah. Uh, I have not heard anything, although I did send them by 
snail mail. So if there's something waiting for us by snail mail, I, I might not have seen it yet. Okay. Did you send them a link to the requirements of the district or did you send them the book? I, I, I sent them a link to the uh, Historic Commission's page about the district. So this was the letter that the commission reviewed I, earlier this fall. Great, good, good. Um, so on that note, um, we are gonna be down to four commissioners and we need to, we need to get some more people on the commission. Um, if anybody has any thoughts about how to get the word around, um, I actually thought about today going on Northampton Ra Neighbors. I don't know if any of you are in part of that. Does anybody get on that? Yeah, I do. There's, um, I'm not a user of it, but I do get their email. Um, but that might be an interesting way. And then, you know, the whole Bay State, there's that big Bay State crowd. Um, they seem like they're pretty, you know, charged up and there may be one or two people there who might be interested, at least to submit an application to the city clerk. So Martha, do you want me to put it on Northampton Neighbors? Because That would be great, Barbara. I'll do that. Oh. Yeah. I'll send a little post and I'll make sure I put the link in for making an application or I could just say if anybody wanted to talk to me about what it involves or something we could. That would be that great. Yeah. I monitor other, other listservs around the city like Ward 4. Ward that would be great. Do you have a default text that you'd like to be inserted into this inquiry? But it can be even really simple, just that there are vacancies on the historical commission and it's right. some in, in interesting commission that deals with a lot of different issues. And if anyone's interested in applying here, here's the link. Yeah, and I think um, I'm following up with a couple other people that I've contacted directly, um, but I, we, we really need to do this. It's been way too long with us just operating as a small group. And, um, you know, as I've said, and this is my next uh, subject that I wanted to bring up, as I've said often, I think that this dem these demolition applications, we're going to see a lot more of these. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the city is, I think, at a point where it's, there's going to, we're going to see some changes with the economy shifting, with the, just the uh, aftermath of COVID and what that has done to the city. Um, this is a really great time for people to getting, be getting involved in um, the commission because we can, you know, we, we could really, History could be a really part of its, a really big part of the his, uh, economic revival of the city if we made it that way. So I think that um, any, you know, encouraging people is a really good thing to do. So if there's anybody, you know, please, by all means, make an effort in the next month to try to reach out. Okay. And can I say one thing, brief thing about the um, State Hospital Memorial Park? Mm-hmm. On yeah. I guess it was November 19th or 20th. Now I can't remember which date. There was a group that met there and had a silent meditation. And then a few people said some words because it was the, yeah, it must be the 20th anniversary of the habeas corpus event that the performance artist, Anna Shulite, you know, the conference she organized with other people and then the habeas corpus, the Magnificat being played at Old Main. Mm -hmm. And she, I, we got a call at 930 in the morning. She said, oh, a group of us are going there. And Steve Campbell, who was the lawyer who was involved with the consent decree in the late 1970s, was there. He led the meditation. He said a few words. I said a couple sentences. A couple other people said things. And I had a handout. I took a few pictures that weren't very good. But it was, um, there were probably 15 people there, I don't know, sitting, you know, sort of safely distant. We were outside. We all had masks on. But it was, for me, it was very moving because it's what we want that site to be, mm -hmm. is a place of meditation and trying to bring some peace and trying to bring some remembrance. Um, so it was, it was really wonderful. And, you know, we just couldn't get the word out because it was, she literally called me and she said, oh, I'm, I'm on my way there now. So, so I went there and Joe was there and a couple other people I know, along with, I think, those, both Anna Shulite and um, Steve Campbell are Buddhist, so I think they contacted some members of their community, and they came, you know, brought their own little cushions and blankets and pillows, and it, it was really quite wonderful. It rang a bell, you know, at the end of the meditation. It, it was very nice, very moving.
So Barbara, if there are any, any observations you had about how well the park functioned for that purpose, let me know, because I, I am going to be working on the planting plan in the next few months. Okay. It'd be great yeah. to have input about that. So we're mostly, you know, a couple of people sat on the benches. Most people were just kind of around, just outside the path, sitting on their blankets and cushions. Okay. Good. So we might want to keep a lot of it open so that people can sit on it so they don't have to feel, oh, I'm sitting in a flower bed. Yeah, okay, well, this is good feedback, thank yeah. you. Yeah, that's, I, that's a good idea, yeah. Okay, um, finally, I wanted to just uh, report that Community Preservation Committee um, has voted our awards for this uh, first round of this year, uh, 2021 it will be, is that right? And, um, we uh, did not expend all of our money. And um, I, I think given what's going on, again, with these demolition requests, and um, as I mentioned, the, what I think are gonna be some major changes in the city, I really think we need to try to push to have this citywide preservation plan done. Um, just the whole neighborhood gathering tonight all of the folks that came out for that, it shows how important neighborhood fabric is. And it, and there's a real need to define what that is. And I think we can really play an active role in doing that. That is one among many things I think that the planning effort can um, accomplish. So I wanted to try to you know get your input on this uh, endorsement to move ahead. Um, I, would, I can work with Sarah on putting an application together for CPA um, to hire an cons outside consultant to do this. Um, I started reaching out to some of my colleagues who can give us some input on money, how much it costs realistically, what the scope of work might be. Um, but I just wanted to kind of have you um, comment. Do you have any ideas about it? Are you opposed? Um, do you think we should move ahead? Is it something that you would be supportive of and want to um, you know, follow? That's, those are my questions. No, I would absolutely support it. I, and as you said, if there's some money left, it sounds like a good idea. And I think that we could um, figure out who might contact who about um, getting some letters of support for the project. For instance, some of the people I would imagine from this neighborhood would say, yes, we will write letters, we'll support this, we'll come and speak in support of it. Um, you know, people who want their, maybe for this to be a little less haphazard, uh, more proactive. So I, I think we should go forward with it. Okay. Craig, yeah. I love that idea. I, um, I've been waiting for this crisis. I didn't expect it to be in Bay State, but it looks like there'll be some interest in this there as well. But all neighborhoods in the city um, undergoing change, and there's, there's a need for a better look, more careful look at what's going on and, and how it impacts communities. And, and, and if, if only to have, as I mentioned before, the like phase two of all the form Bs. Phase one was done in the 70s. We had a little update in the but I think there's a need for going beyond the, you know, there's a lot of houses that, that are in the working class districts that are under crisis pressure now that need to be discovered as yeah. something. Because it is important to these people. So let's give them a chance to rank form these. We have someone who will be a consultant to come in and teach them how to do yeah. it. I agree with you, Craig, and I also think that um, just you know, stepping a little bit larger scale, I think that um, you know, just again looking at what happened tonight, I think that if if people were asked to get involved in helping to define the character of their community for us, their neighborhood, excuse me, mm -hmm. um, I think they would come forward. I, it's clear that so many of the people in Bay State care about the character of that place. And I think it's, I think it is really um, responsibility to the city to allow its citizens who have lived there a long time with own property, have paid taxes, have raised their kids, have made, you know, long-term relationships 
to um, define what that character is and try to, and for us to find a way to hold on to that rather than making a place for, you know, people who might live here 20 years from now. Um, it's, I think we owe it to them. So I, you know, that could be part of our process. I want to, I want to say something else. There was, I think, three speakers that spoke positively about John's final product, product you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's no question about that. And I just thought that was very nice that they came up and they thought of him enough to speak up on his behalf about the quality of what he's doing, which is different than what our main purview, of course, was. But I just thought that was nice. Yeah. Dylan, do you have any thoughts? You're, You're muted. muted. You muted. All right, I have two uh, rescue kittens in the room, so they're making a lot of noise. So I can That's okay. having, having to mute myself. My dog was um, barking earlier, right? We started. I think it sounds great. I think this is exactly the sort of work we should be doing and to get out ahead of these issues and to get make the community aware of things before they come before us, and also to get some clarity around this. You know, we're not against infill and affordable housing, we just need to think about how it's done intelligently in this community and find that balance and have more structure around which to talk about these issues. I agree. Yeah. Okay, good. All right, so um, Sarah and I will get working on that and um, we'll get be back in touch with you. Sarah, when are the applications due, January? Uh, February. February. Some time. Okay. Great. All right. Uh, any other comments? Any other uh, concerns? Anyone? Anything else? It's after seven, so we should sign off unless other people have other items. Set that December meeting, or is oh yeah? Just Do we want to yes. number yeah. The uh, so the, the last Monday in December is the twenty eighth. I don't know how the holidays exist for people or, or whether anyone is unavailable for any dates, but it, we're not wedded to that last Monday. There are other days that we're trying to people. I'm free any Monday in December if it has to be a Monday. We're saying maybe the 21st would be good because it's it would be better. Yeah. Would that be better for people? Craig's checking. I'm all set. Nicole. Be fine with me. Okay. I'm not going <laughs> yeah, I'm not at work or not allowed in the building for the nine days before the 21st. So if there's any last minute historical research or work, it might be hard to pull off. Dylan, I wanted to just say, I thought you did an amazing job tonight. Um, just giving the background on it was it was very um it was not only informative it was just really heartfelt and i thought that um i was i thought it was unfortunate the attorney didn't seem to pick up on your facts <laughs> i decided not to comment on what he said he just yeah you know I, he almost said you know we're not in a court of law and we to, to for him to be like parsing words important means this i mean it's, he was really he, I found him annoying. Whoops, we're being recorded. Uh oh. Well, and also, also the fact is the, the criteria, uh, criteria C and D are subjective. You know, they're not. It's not a black and white situation. Um, right. And you know, we as a commission have to define what um, you know we think of as important, and right. we think of as significant um, based on the based on the you know the the data that we have, which is you know provided beautifully by Dylan and then Chris. Mm -hmm. So it was, yeah. I like the fact that this is coming forward really, it, it shows a divide that 45 years ago when the form B's were all done, and this isn't just Northampton, it's, it's everywhere. I'm a student of form B's in Hoyle too. 
movies done two generations really about the big glam places. Mm -hmm. And it's people I really key out, Greg. Craig. Local historic district. It's all part of the pattern that now these more worker class places are being rediscovered first as a cohesive neighborhood, Bay State. That was a forgotten name for 50 years. Now it's coming back. And now I think we're going to see a reawakening on the discover of the modest antique houses. In the city. And I love that. This is. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I was a little concerned tonight about the nature that the chat, when it turned to people saying, you know, like mm -hmm. talking about how much homes cost, it was going in a direction yeah. that wasn't very good. Yeah, I, I know. I have, clients, I have clients who, um, you know, municipalities who just, they've dismantled the chat function just for that very reason, because it's sort of like, um, you know, it's like Twitter. It's like using it like a Twitter, like our, you know, President Trump used for four years. Yeah. But I want to just apologize for what I said about the lawyer, but I feel like he, you know, he didn't, I, what you said, he didn't realize it was subjective and he was being, he just struck me that he was acting and talking as if he were in a courtroom. Yeah. Which he thought was not appropriate. Uh, for, the, anyway. for the public hearing, do people want to see if I could disable the chat feature just because it, it did start getting a, a little nasty? I think um, in the public hearing, we have to allow everyone to speak, right? I mean, it's not. Uh, we, we don't have to oh. use the chat feature. So it, it could no, be. No, but I'm same. saying we have to let people speak. I don't. Sorry, sometimes I use a computer that doesn't have a microphone. So the chat is the only way I can communicate. So I right. don't think that maybe we just have to ask people to be civil and. Mm. Or I wondered whether we could have some structure around it, like where it's allowed during the public comment section um, and then disabled afterwards. Um, so it's just sort of gives people an opportunity to express themselves in the same way that they normally would, but doesn't give them additional you know, we wouldn't have people interrupting us in the middle of our deliberations if we were all physically in a room. So right. Right. I don't know if that can be done. I know we these are all things we're all figuring out in the new world. Yeah, I think at a certain point, I, I think I could I could shut it off. And we could clearly instruct people to only right. not chat with each other and, and only direct questions and comments to the commission. Sir, I think you can, um, can't you, I think you can set it up so people can just, are only allowed to like address comments to you. Oh yeah, you could uh, do that. Yes, right? I could do that. I think that's what you can do. And then we'll, and then you'll record it, right? So then we can get, the, we can get the recording of it. Well, the only issue with that, I mean, it, it happened tonight, my, um, my internet, kicked me off and if that happens i lose the chat so i can only see what what's been chatted since i rejoined right and then if people have questions for the committee sarah would have to repeat every one of them to us but you could let us know and then somebody else could save the chat if you've lost some of it sarah well i i say i just saved it so i have the okay. whole thing i think it's the whole thing yeah, and, and did we say December 21st we were going to do that? Mm -hmm. Okay. I just wasn't sure if we'd agreed. Beautiful. Okay, great. Okay. I think this went great. I think you guys did really, you're all amazing. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thanks a lot. It is more difficult this way, but it somehow we make it work. Although, on, I guess on the bright side, this is the most people that have ever come to a historic commission meeting. Really? I know. It's very wow. exciting. I've never seen a crowd this big. Yeah. I know. Well, they care a lot about their neighborhood, and I, you know, I can understand that. I mean, yeah. it's 
So the, so the question was, since this wasn't a public hearing, how do people know that this determination was going to be made today? There was a, um, not a petition, I, I guess it was, a, it was sort of an information package that was circulated um, throughout Bay State. And I got a copy of it um, yesterday because one of my good friends lives there and she sent it to me. She took a photo of it and sent it to me. Um, but it had all the information about how to get involved and this was one of the um, things that was on listed. It has one of the more cohesive neighborhood associations and yeah. connected in. I monitor most of them. And, and so I knew that this was a, I knew I, when I saw this, what was happening 10 days ago, I knew this was going to be a, a tidal wave here tonight. 30, no, it's not the same as a public hearing. We probably would have had standing. And, and just, um, Procedurally, if it if it comes out the just to be clear, the ordinance does not require a butter notification for demolition review hearings, and I, I believe the thinking behind that was that these are more than just neighborhood issues that this affects the entire city, and it, it wouldn't really make sense to just right. notify the abutters. But we do do the yellow public notice sign. We don't do a gazette advertisement. I, I don't know the history of why that that is required. Yeah. But, um, at another time, at another time, I might want us to. The commission to discuss whether or not somehow we could change that because I do feel that on 39 Landy people didn't know about it and so we didn't get information and or didn't even if it wasn't information just to hear let people have their voices and I think that's not a good thing um, so again you say it's not in the statute but maybe we can figure out some way to to do something to let people know I would agree with that wholeheartedly because I think that I think too that is a flaw that Landy <clears throat> Landy uh, happened the way it did and people had no 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 knowing. I think there has to be maybe like this was the two step process. I'm not sure, but it just seemed to me that Landy didn't go the best way. And people don't feel respected, and that's the. The worst thing that we can have happen is people. I know. Well, so, but Craig, you said two step. I mean, how, Sarah, how did the people find out about this? Um, I'm, I'm you got, not oh, really sure. Um, was it because I, I the demolition permit was granted by an accident? Is that what? Uh, I, I believe it's, it's, it was just a neighborhood sort of word of mouth. And the, okay. the that they have, mm -hmm. um, but I, I don't know how it initially started finding out about it. And so this was the exact same process that was followed with the, the Landy Avenue yeah. property. But for whatever reason, more people picked up on this one. It, it may be because of Landy Avenue. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, unless we have other business, um, I think we should retire tonight, and we'll take this up again on the twenty-first. Good. And Sarah, will that be also a regular meeting or should we, um, what do you want to do about that? Uh, it depend, I guess it depends, depends on what else. Okay. But it, um, certainly the public hearing in any case. Okay. If anything else that comes up between now and then, it's, it's really pressing. All right. Well. Good. Bye bye. Thanks. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Have a good night. Hey, you too. Bye bye. Bye.